Well, thank you so much, and it's great to be here. I've really looked forward to this series, and I'm happy that you have made your way here as well. And uh, I think we're going to have a great time during the next four evenings that we're going to spend together uh, really discovering uh, this subject of religion, what went wrong. It's actually one year ago that uh, I was in Copenhagen for the last time, and I see some familiar faces that also attended those meetings, so it's good to see you again for this new series. I do remember that I w when I was here last year, in the end of March, it was a bit warmer. And so I really looked forward to uh, a, a, an early spring as I came from Norway, where there's still a lot of snow. But um, it was good. It was good. But could have been a little bit more warmer. But we'll get there. Uh, but thank you again for coming. And uh, I just really look forward to delve into this exciting topic. Uh, this has been actually a theme that um, has been developing in my mind over several years. I work as a pastor uh, in Norwegian, but I also in Norway, but I also travel quite a bit around the world, conducting seminars and. Uh, as I have interactions with people and discussions with people, this is kind of a theme that has just been developing in my mind because I know there's a lot of people that are disappointed with organized religion. And I think there are good reasons for that. At the same time, I meet a lot of people that are inspired by the person Jesus. And uh, what we're going to discover throughout this series is that Religion, as we many times see it throughout history and as we see it today, is very different than what we see in the person Jesus. As we peel back the layers of tradition and man-made religion, uh, and we get back to the very person of Jesus, I think we're going to be able to discover some, uh, some differences there. And I hope and pray that you will be inspired by some of the content that we will be looking at together. And uh, so what I always like to do before I present is uh, have a short word of prayer, and I hope that's okay with you, because I believe that the Holy Spirit inspired God's Word, and it's the same Spirit that I need as uh, a teacher and a presenter of God's Word. And so um, if it's okay, I'll have a short word of prayer, and then we'll delve right into this exciting subject. Tonight our subject is, Has the Christian Religion Lost Its Plot? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Uh, for this opportunity to be back in Denmark, to be back in Copenhagen, thank you that we have gathered here together for a journey tonight. And I ask that you will bless this journey, that you will guide us in our thoughts and in all that we will be looking at together. Make this subject clear for us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I'm going to start with this quote. And for those of, the, of you that were with us a year ago when I did a short series, which was Quite, on quite some different topics, uh, you might remember that I did bring up this quote in one of my presentations, and I love it because I think it really capsulates what has happened throughout the last 2,000 years in the history of the Christian church. And Saint Pascal, he said it, he said it the following way, he wrote it in the following way, uh, Christianity started out in Palestine as a fellowship. It moved to Greece and became a philosophy, it moved to Italy and became an institution. It moved to Europe and became a culture. It moved to America and became an enterprise. Isn't that true that when you look at the journey of Christianity over the last 2,000 years, it is something very differently today than what it was back then. When Jesus started calling disciples and when he started teaching them about the principles of life, um, the, the, this very organic movement began, but as it started to grow, it changed along the way. And when I ask people today, what do you think about when you think about the Christian religion? Some people will say, for me, the Christian religion, well, it's like a tradition. You know, once a year I might go to church on Christmas or on Easter. Uh, for others, it's like a philosophy. That's an interesting concept. It's an interesting theory. For others, actually, in certain parts of the world, it, is, it has even become a business. But what we want to do is we want to pull back these layers. We want to go back to the roots of Christianity and discover what it is really about. We also want to expose, in the course of these evenings that we're going to spend together, what has gone wrong 
uh, in the course of church history. Uh, and we're going to look at the contrast. We're going to look at the, both the comparison and the contrast of religion and then the person, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I want to invite you, and this I also did uh, a year ago when we embarked on our journey then. We were looking at different topics than we're going to look at this time. But I did invite you, and I'm going to invite you again tonight, to put on the prophetic glasses. And what I mean by that is that we are going to take a look at the world. We're going to take a look at history and present times and future times through the glasses of Bible prophecy. And so, uh, figuratively speaking, I hope that you're ready to just put on those prophetic glasses and to allow yourself to look around, both at the past, the present, and the future, through the pages of Scripture, which is going to be a very interesting um, experience. And what I like to say when I conduct these meetings in different places is, if you like the glasses, you can keep them. Okay, at the end of this course, at the end of these meetings. So see, see, see how you like the picture that will emerge as we embark on this journey together. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the last book in the Bible. And tonight our topic is actually going to revolve around a couple of chapters, chapters 2 and 3, of the last book in the Bible. And the last book in the Bible is called the book of Revelation. Uh, it comes from the word apocalypse or the unveiling of something. Uh, it's interesting because uh, I've done many lectures on the book of Revelation in many different countries in the world. And I remember one time a young lady came to me after one of the lectures and she said, you know, this is the first time I heard a presentation about the book of Revelation. And I said, okay, well, that's great. I hope you enjoyed it. And then she says, yeah, but, you know, my pastor told me that the book of Revelation cannot be understood. And so I asked her the question. I said, how many books are there in the Bible? Do you know how many books there are in the Bible? And she said, um, no, I'm not quite sure. I said, okay, there are 66 books in the Bible. And um, how many of them do you think can be understood? And she said, well, I don't know. Um, well, according to my pastor, probably 65 then. I said, okay, so 65 of them can be understood, and the last one can't. And is it coincidental that the last book in the Bible has the title Revelation? <laughs> And she looked at me with a smile and she said, okay, yeah, well, maybe, maybe it can be understood. Uh, it's not for nothing that the book is called Revelation or an unveiling. It's not, it's not given to just confuse us. It's, this book is not given to just make us, you know, uh, wonder what it's all about. When we approach this book with a prayerful spirit and an open heart and an open mind, I believe it can indeed be understood. And that's what we're going to do throughout these evenings as well. The book of Revelation was written by the disciple John. John was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was one of the younger disciples when he got called. So he was, was with Jesus for three and a half years. The interesting thing about John is that later in his life, he got sent to an island called Patmos. And it was on the island of Patmos, which is in the, in the Aegean Sea. You can actually visit this island today. And it was on this island that he received these visions and revelations that he wrote down and that are now accessible to us in the last book uh, of the Bible. Now, I want to just read a couple of verses here to yeah, let you get a feel of how this book begins, because these are the very first verses in the book of Revelation. Uh, and we read the following. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. And listen to this, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are in it for the time is near. And that's why I can say with confidence that you can go away from this presentation tonight blessed because that's what it says here. Blessed is he who reads, blessed is he who hears the words of this prophecy. Now, there are different methods of interpretation when it comes to the book of Revelation. And the three schools of interpretation that are out there today uh, are basically the following. Preterism, 
which uh, is just a fancy word, but uh, what it means is that they are interpreting the book um, that it's based on the past. So the book of Revelation is dealing with events in the days of John, so 2,000 years ago. Basically doesn't have so much to say about the times in which we're living today. That's, that's preterism. Then you have futurism, which says, no, 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 the book of Revelation is all about the future. So none of it has happened yet, but it's all going to happen one day in the future uh, at the culmination of uh, world's history. And then you have the third uh, method of interpretation, and which, the, which is the one that I find most logical. And um, I have read a significant amount uh, of material on these various interpretations, but I find definitely historicism uh, to be the one that makes most sense, and that is the approach that it's a historic unfolding of events from the first century, so from the time that John wrote this book, until now and into the future. So what is happening through the book of Revelation is that God is revealing to John what's going to happen both in his time, but also what's going to come and what's going to happen right until Jesus Christ comes back the second time. Because we find multiple promises in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, about the second coming of Jesus. And so I can just be very upfront with you here that in our approach tonight, we're going to use the historicist approach. We're going to look at the passages of Revelation as they speak from the time of John to our time. And I think you'll see that this uh, makes sense. Now, Revelation uses expressions from the Old Testament. So in order for us to understand the book of Revelation, we actually need to take the totality of Scripture, the totality of the Bible. Sometimes people try to understand the book of Revelation merely on events that are happening in the news. And they say, oh, look, here something is taking place or this. In order for us to have an approach that is truthful to the way that Scripture has been presented to us, we need to understand the totality of Scripture. There are many words and phrases that we come across in the book of Revelation that are taken directly from other passages of Scripture and much of it in the Old Testament. And by comparing these passages, it starts to make sense. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at a prophecy in the book of Revelation that we find in chapters 2 and 3 that deal with the history of the Christian church and how it has lost its plot. So imagine this, that we have letters in the Bible, we have prophecies in the Bible that predict what was going to happen to the Christian religion that predict what we actually have been able to see as we look back. Because we have, we have the privilege of hindsight. We're living in 2023. We can look back over the last 2,000 years, and we can see what has happened with the Christian church. Now, what we're going to look at tonight are letters from the perspective of John 2,000 years ago, and he was looking forward. And God was revealing to him through the Holy Spirit what was going to happen to the Christian movement. And now we are in 2023, and we're going to study these letters and see, does it match with what we see in history? So it's going to be very exciting. Now, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, uh, John, the writer of the book of Revelation, he says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. So John is going to write his message to seven churches. Now, these seven churches we actually find in modern Turkey today, um, known as Asia Minor uh, back then. And you can actually see these seven cities here on the map. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so um, uh, John, being in captivity on this island of Patmos, is sending these letters to these places where he had himself ministered. He himself had proclaimed the gospel message in these places. And so he's writing letters to them. And in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, chapter 1 is basically just an introduction. And then chapters 2 and 3, it records seven letters that John wrote to these seven destinations. And you might think, well, what is interesting about seven letters that were written for 2,000 years ago to seven destinations in Turkey? Well, we're going to find out that these letters are very prophetic in nature. 
They describe things that the Christian church would go through, and when we have hindsight now, we see that the church has gone through. Now, take notice of Revelation chapter 1 as we're still here in the introduction prior to the letters that are then going to be uh, written and which we're going to look at in chapters 2 and 3. Look at what it says. It says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And the Alpha and Omega, it's none other than Jesus himself. So Jesus, the one that died and resurrected, is now the one that appears to John on the island and says, okay, here is a message that I want you to write to these seven churches. Uh, and then he lists these seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, as we read through these letters to these seven churches, we're going to find out that they both have a historic application in the time of John, but they're much more than that. Uh, they are also spiritual counsel for us today and to people of all times, but again, they're much more than that also. And uh, maybe most of interest for us, particularly tonight, regarding our topic, Has Christianity Lost Its Plot?, is this element, the prophetic panorama of the story of Christianity. And well, what we're going to see is that in these seven letters, there's a progress. There's a progress of what Christianity is going three, through throughout the centuries. It's interesting to note that in the first three of these letters, there is no mention of the second coming of Jesus. But then when you get to letter four, five, six, and seven, there is a mention that Jesus is coming soon. And it's interesting that there, there seems to be this, this, this build-up as we're getting closer and closer to the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Uh, in the fourth letter to Thyatira, Jesus says, because Jesus is quoted by John in these letters, so it's a direct revelation of Jesus to these churches. He says, hold fast what you have till I come. In the fifth letter, Jesus says, if you will not watch I will come upon you as a thief. In the sixth letter, he says, behold, I am coming quickly. And in the seventh letter, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's getting closer and closer as we're moving through time. Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, there's a structure in each of these letters that we're going to see as we move through them. And it's basically the following. Jesus begins by introducing himself. Then he gives counsel to the church. And then finally, he gives a promise of victory for the faithful. So we're going to start with the first letter. And we're going to go back in time. So we push the rewind button. And we go back 2,000 years. And we go back to the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a very important city in the Roman Empire. It was a city where a lot of people met and exchanged ideas. Uh, you could consider it in many ways the religious capital of the Roman Empire. You know, you had Athens, which was the philosophical capital of the Roman Empire. Then you have, of course, Rome itself. Uh, you had Corinth, which was the, uh, the capital of trade. But then you have Ephesus, which was really the capital of religion. There was a lot of different gods and goddesses that were worshipped uh, in the city of Ephesus. And John himself was actually working in this city. He was, a, he was a pastor over a congregation in the city of Ephesus. And um, here he is writing a letter from Patmos. He's, he's a captive now. He's, he can't go anywhere. He's exiled. He's in Patmos. But he writes this letter to Ephesus. And listen to what he says. And here he's quoting the very words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus speaks to him and he writes down these words and sends this letter. And Jesus says the following. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now we're going to see a little bit of this symbolic language that is used in these letters. But uh, again, by comparing scripture with scripture, we can find out 
a little bit of the meaning of these words. Basically, in the first chapter of Revelation, it tells us that the seven golden lampstands are symboli symbolizing the seven churches. And so when it says that he's walking in the midst of them, basically what Jesus is saying is like, I'm still with you. And this was very important for the early church because they saw Jesus when he was on earth and when he died and resurrected and ascended, he was no longer with them. But then they get this assurance through this letter, hey, I'm still with you. I'm still presently with you. Through his spirit, he was among the believers. Now listen to what he gives as counsel to this church of Ephesus. He says, you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become wary. And actually, when you look at the early church, it's fascinating to recognize that they were a vervent church. They were a church that preached the gospel with power. They moved from city to city. And uh, especially one of my favorite books in the Bible, actually, is the book of Acts. And it comes right after the gospels. So in the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels. And then you have this book called Acts. And it's basically a story of the first believers. And how despite persecution and despite setbacks and challenges, they moved from city to city from country to country, and they spread the gospel. Among them were, of course, the disciples, the apostles, but also the apostle Paul, which was a well-known figure that wrote a lot of letters that we have in the New Testament. And so this church was growing. This church was expanding. This church had a lot going for it. But um, Jesus also says the following in this first letter. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. As time goes on, and we, I think we can all relate to this somehow, as time goes on, it's very easy to lose that enthusiasm. Uh, and I know, you know, maybe you can relate to this when you, when you first um, heard the Christian message or when you, were, when you first were inspired by the person Jesus and, and then later on as life goes on and, 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 and as years go by, maybe at times you feel like, oh, I wish I had that same enthusiasm that I had back then. And, and Jesus is saying to this first church, don't, don't lose that enthusiasm. Don't lose that fire in your heart for the gospel. And then finally, we have this promise of victory. And in verse 7, it says, To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And I love how each time in the end of these letters, you have this promise of what is going to take place when everything will be restored in the end. And the Bible is fascinating because the Bible describes in the beginning, in the first chapters of Genesis, a world in which there is no sin and no suffering and no death. And then it describes in the end of the book, we have 66 books covering 1,500 years, 40 different authors written on three different continents. But after this entire narrative of scripture, in the end, the last two chapters of the Bible, again, talk about a restored world where everything is made right and where there's perfect harmony between God and man. And there's this description of the tree of life, which is really a description of this, this harmony that all nations will eat of this tree. The, the, there's, a, there's this beautiful picture that emerges from the book of Revelation about this final promise, this final destination. And so in this letter, uh, John, that John is writing to the first church, he says, if you remain faithful, you'll be there at the tree of life in the end. And so here I'm going to just put up a little bit of a, uh, a timeline here so we get an idea of where we are heading. And we started here with the church of Ephesus, which is basically described the, the apostolic church era. But now we're going to move into the second letter, and we're going to also see that we are progressing in time. And what we're going to be... As we, as we go through this together, uh, in the end of our presentation, we're going to find ourselves where we are today. So just hang on in there as we go on this epic journey through uh, the Christian ages, through centuries, and see what is God revealing through these prophetic letters about Christianity. And, and we're going to see that along the way, it does lose its plot. But in the end, something's going to be restored. So uh, hang in there. Now, you might also notice that I'm not, I'm not putting up all the verses in these letters because then we wouldn't have time to go through this tonight. But you can go back, and if you're interested, you can basically just read these letters in chapters 2 and 3 
of the book of Revelation, the last book in your Bible. But let's go, to, let's go to the second letter, the letter to the church of Smyrna. Smyrna, again, a city there in Asia Minor in modern Turkey. And uh, this is what Jesus writes to this church. And remember, when John is writing this, he's just quoting the words of Jesus. In the entire letters are all direct quotations from Jesus himself. And this is what Jesus says to the church of Smyrna. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. So Jesus reveals himself to this second church as the one that has been raised from the dead. Now that's very important because as we look at the message to this church, we will find out that it's addressed to a people that are going through persecution. It's addressed to a people that are going through a difficult time of oppression trials. And so Jesus relating them to say, hey, but I, I, I died, but I rose. And if you remain faithful, despite of these challenges, you also will receive the gift of eternal life. Now look at the counsel to Smyrna, the message to Smyrna. Here, Jesus writes the following, do not, or Jesus is, is, is um, John is quoting the words of Jesus here. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Now, what is fascinating about these letters is that they have these various dimensions to them. So historically, this was also the case in the city of Smyrna in the days of John. So yes, it was a place where there was a persecution against the Christians. But more than that, these letters are not only applicable to the days of John, they also portray events that would happen throughout the centuries. And when we look at the Christian development, it didn't take long, when we get into the second century, that a great persecution broke out against the followers of Jesus. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can, you can visit... <laughs> different places in Europe and, and, and other places where you will learn, where you can learn about uh, this uh, segment of history. Uh, many Christians lost their lives because of their faith. Uh, as a matter of fact, the 12 disciples that were called by Jesus, uh, all of them died a martyr's death. Well, Judas, he, he, he took his own life, the one that betrayed Jesus, but, but besides Judas, all of them died a martyr's death except John that was exiled to Patmos. And, 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 and he wrote, of course, the book of Revelation from Patmos. The rest of them died for their faith. And, and later, as we get into the second century, uh, there was a great persecution that broke out against the Christians um, in the Roman Empire, especially by the Caesar Diocletian. And Thousands upon thousands of Christians lost their lives in this persecution. But I'm sure that these words of Jesus would have been of great comfort to them. Uh, and Jesus gave them a promise of victory. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, when it says second death, that means that, you know, there's a natural death that we die in this world as a consequence of sin and brokenness. But... It's not an eternal death. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about this death that we die here on earth as a mere sleep. Because when Christ comes again, he will wake us up and give us eternal life. And so those that, those that hold on to Jesus, they will not be overcome or hurt by the second death. It's a great promise to the church uh, and a great promise to those that were going through this persecution. Now you might think, well, didn't that stop Christianity then? If there was this great persecution, didn't, why didn't just the Christian church die out? Well, there was this famous author that wrote it this way. Um, the blood of the martyr, martyrs was like the seed of the gospel. And so what happened is the more they killed, the more sprung up. It was almost like this multiplication effect. And so they were not able uh, to stop the Christian church. It was just like wildfire it was growing despite of this persecution. But what is interesting is as we get to the next period, there's a little bit of a different tactic in order to stop this movement. Because if it couldn't be stopped by persecution, well, 
what was a harder thing to deal with was, it was compromise. And so what we're going to see as we move now into the next phase is we go from the apostolic church to the persecuted church to the compromising church. And this is basically where Christianity starts to lose its plot. Because what took place, let's take a look at this. Now we've come to the period of Pergamon, the church of Pergamon. And listen to the message uh, to the church of Pergamon. Jesus says, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, every time it's interesting the way Jesus introduces himself. To the first church, he says, I'm the one that walks among the candlesticks. I'm still with you. To the second church, he says, I am the one that has overcome death. And they were dealing with persecution. And to the third, he says, I'm the one who has the two-edged sword. Now, you might think, what is the two-edged sword? Oh, here we need to just compare scripture with scripture. And the Bible actually tells us what the two-edged sword represents. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we read, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when Jesus says he's the one with the two-edged sword, out of his mouth comes the the Word of God. Now, we have the Word of God today um, in the Bible, uh, the 66 books in the Bible, written over a time span of 1,500 years, 40 different authors. We have put together here the words of God inspired through individuals that lived throughout many centuries. But this Word of God has been under attack. <laughs> the Word of God is the very foundation of Christianity. It is to give direction to the church regarding the teachings and life of Jesus. But what we see happen in this third period that is described in Revelation through these letters is a time of compromise. Now listen to what it says in this message here to Pergamon. Jesus says the following in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immor immorality. Now, you might think, oh, there's some language here. Well, what does that mean? Now, here we come to a very important key in interpreting the book of Revelation, and that is the totality of Scripture. In other words, when there are phrases and words taken from the Old Testament stories, then we need to look, okay, what happened in that Old Testament story, and what is this telling about this period of history that now Jesus is describing? And um, Jesus says, is, is referring here to Balaam and Balak. Now, it's kind of not a very well-known story in the Old Testament, but if you go back into the Old Testament, you will find the story of how the Israelites, the Hebrews, were called out of Egypt. And you remember Moses was the leader, and he led them through the Red Sea. God opened up the sea, and they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they were going to go into this land that God was going to give them, the land of Canaan. But as they come to the borders of Canaan, something interesting takes place. As they're at the borders of Canaan, there's this king in Canaan, and his name was Balak. And he was getting very nervous because he saw what God was doing through these Hebrews. And he thought, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, and so he hears about this prophet. Now, obviously, when you read the story about this prophet, the prophet um, was named uh, Balaam, uh, you find out that he wasn't... Uh, God's man. <laughs> he was obviously um, a self-proclaimed prophet that was following a little bit of different kinds of revelations from another power. But, but he gets a hold of this Balaam and he says, you know what, Balaam, can't you, just, can't you just curse these people for me? Because if you curse them, then maybe they won't be able to possess this land of Canaan. And so they get Balaam to come and then the story is very interesting. As Balaam is about to curse these people, the Hebrews, and he's standing there on a mountaintop and he's about to curse them, then only blessings come out of his mouth. It's like God overrides the whole thing and he's not able to curse them. But Balak and Balaam come up with kind of plan B. Okay, we can't curse these people. Well, let's come up with plan B. And what they do is they send these Midianite women into the camp uh, that lead the men of, of, of Israel uh, into idolatry, the worship of other gods. 
And so basically what we are reading in this, in this passage here um, is a description of a compromise amongst God's chosen people. They started worshiping God's very different gods than the God that had called them out of Egypt and led them so far. Now, in the course of Christian history, something similar has taken place. You know, we started out with a powerful movement proclaiming the person Jesus Christ and the teachings of Jesus, and it spread like wildfire. Then we come into the, in the second century and great persecution breaks out upon Christianity and it continues to grow. The blood of the martyrs is like the seed of the gospel. It can't be stopped. The teachings of Jesus are just revolutionizing cities and towns and the highways and the byways and people are inspired and the church is growing. But then when you get to the third century, something takes place. Christianity has become so big by this time that now there is a shift and what takes place is that Christianity becomes political. Now, this is something that we're going to get back to in the course of our time together. Actually, tomorrow night, and you don't want to miss that, tomorrow night we're going to go on a journey in a prophecy uh, from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and we're going to show how politics entered the church and how this was foretold hundreds of years before it happened and how this basically um, destroyed um, the, the, the whole movement of Christianity, but how God is also calling out and exposing this through the scriptures. So we'll look a little bit more at that uh, tomorrow night. But in the course of history, um, there was a great shift specifically in the time of Constantine the Great. Now, maybe you've heard of Constantine. Constantine was a Roman uh, emperor, and he was the first Roman emperor that officially became a Christian. Now, I do like quote marks here because it's debated whether or not this was a true conversion. We don't know, but from all we can tell of observing what took place, um, it was a very confused uh, move. It was a very confused Christianity that emerged out of this. Now, Constantine believed that, you know, God had given him a vision and he was to conquer in the name of God. And before him, all the emperors were... Um, opposed to Christianity. They believed in all these pagan deities. But under Constantine, now Christianity became accepted. So Christianity goes from being on the margin to now being center in the empire. And you could think, well, that's, that's, that's great. It wasn't great at all. As a matter of fact, the very nucleus of Christianity being rooted and grounded in the person of Jesus came under fierce attack when Christianity became political. Now, what Constantine did is in order to unite his empire, which was very fractured, and it was made up of many Christians and many pagans, in order to unite his empire, he said to the pagans, he said, okay, just bring your paganism into Christianity and we'll just merge it all together. One historian put it this way, under Constantine, paganism was baptized. So he had these pagan traditions, and so let, let's just put them under water, and now they're Christian traditions. And, and, and th what took place is, is very interesting uh, to look at. And, and, and we're going to go a lot more into this uh, tomorrow night, actually, to look at that, that phase of history. Uh, but take notice of the promise of victory that is given to this third church or this letter to Pergamon. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, it's interesting with manna. Manna was something that they ate in the wilderness when they were wandering around for those 40 years uh, in the time of Moses. God gave them manna. Later on, Jesus said that the manna was a symbol of the word of God, and he called himself the manna that had come down from heaven, revealing God's character. Uh, and so again, it's a reference to God's revelation or God's word. And again, God's word was under attack during this period. So we're moving along here from the apostolic church to the persecuted church to the compromising church period. And take notice what this compromise led to. And now we come to the time of Thyatira. And listen to this message to the church of Thyatira. Jesus introduces himself again, as always. He says, these things says the Son of God, 
who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. And in that is a little bit of this uh, persecution language, like something is being refined. And uh, listen to the message itself. It's actually very similar to the counsel that was given to Pergamos, but it's just a, a, a further deepening of a very unfortunate situation. Uh, it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, again, a reference to an Old Testament story, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So again, you get, you get this idea of there's idolatry that is coming in among God's people. Now, the story of Jezebel is taken from the Old Testament. It's a very interesting story just like the story of Balak. It has some similarities, but it's also a little bit different. Jezebel was a queen uh, from a different nation that married a Israelite king, King Ahab. And you can read about this in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings. And as they united, uh, Jezebel was actually the one that was kind of ruling <laughs> the country. And she wanted to get rid of the Hebrew religion. She wanted to get rid of monotheism and she introduced idol idol worship she introduced Baal prophets they worship the the this god of the called Baal and actually they killed God's true prophets and there was one prophet that had to flee and his name was Elijah maybe you've heard of the story and he had to flee from Jezebel and so he spends this time in the wilderness and God takes care of him and then comes this 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 great showdown between the religion of Elijah and the religion of Jezebel and God manifests himself in a powerful way. You can go back and read the story, but, but the point for us tonight is this. During the reign of Jezebel, God's true people were persecuted. But this time, the persecution is happening from within. So if you look at the span of Christian history, the first time that the Christians were persecuted, they were persecuted by pagan religions. They were persecuted by the Roman authorities by Diocletian and other of these Caesars, by the time you get to the fourth century, and specifically when you move into the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth century, you find that there's a different persecuting power now. It's the church itself. The Christian church has now become the power that is persecuting those that think and believe differently. Now, we're going to go also a little bit more into this tomorrow night, but I can introduce a period of time that is very significant in church history. And this is the period of 1260 years between 538 AD to 1798 AD. Now, why is this so, so, so specific, this period? It's because during these long centuries, the church and the state were united. Now, prior to that, the church could say what it wanted to say, and it could have its dogmas, it could have its doctrines, and you could say, well, you know, I like that, but I don't like that, and so there was freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. But from 538, there was a unity between the bishops of Rome and the state authorities and kings in Europe. And so from 538 to 1798, for 1260 years, the church ruled supremely. And if you disagreed with the church, which was based in Rome at that time, the Roman church, if you disagreed with the Roman church, well, you could, be, you could lose all your property, you could be sent uh, out of the empire, uh, or you could be banished, or you could lose your life. And millions of people... <laughs> lost their lives because they believed differently than the Roman church at that time. Now, just think about this. Has the Christian religion lost its plot? I think when, we're, when we arrive in this period of the Dark Ages, we can say a resounding, yes, the Christian religion has lost its plot. Did Jesus as a person in the first century ever talk about forcing people to believe in certain ways? The answer is no. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus gave an invitation for the gospel message to be received in the heart and in the mind. Jesus that created human beings, created them with a free will and a free conscience. And the, and the gospel was never intended to be forced upon people. 
But as we go through the eras of the Christian church, we see that specifically in what we call the Dark Ages, it was a time in which the very church was the persecuting power and used its dogmas and teachings to oppress people. And I believe that we are still suffering the consequences of that era. Many people that I talk with today that are not religious, they will say, they will refer to things that have happened in the name of Christianity. And I perfectly agree with them that there have been atrocious things that have been done in the name of Jesus and in the name of Christianity. Now, what I always hope to reveal, and also through seminars like this, is that we need to distinguish between what has been done in the name of Christianity and what actually the name Jesus represents in his life and teachings. Amen? I think that's a very important distinction that we need to make. But during this period of 1260 years, there was a ferocious persecution. And actually, I must say that I'm really a historian, or I'm, I love history. <laughs> I'm not an official historian, but I love reading history. And what I sometimes find lacking in the um, history classes that are being taught in high schools and colleges and universities is that um, this particular segment of history of what the Christian church uh, has done is, is, is often um, just addressed maybe on the surface unfortunately. There's a lot more that it can be delved into. And that's why I meet a lot of people today that are not, maybe not as, as, as familiar with what actually the Christian church has done in the course of history and how millions and millions and millions of people have lost their lives uh, in the name of false religion. More people have lost their lives by believing differently than the church of Rome than people that lost their lives during the Holocaust. I mean, even more. Uh, and so it's important for us to address these things and to look at this history and see what went wrong. Where did Christianity lose its plot? Now, this date, we're going to come back more to that also in our presentation tomorrow. But basically what happened in 1798 is the, the combination between church and state was broken. Uh, it was Berche, which was the commander under Napoleon, that marched into the city of Rome, and he took the Pope captive in 1798, and he separated church from state. And so this, this, this period of what is often referred to as the Dark Ages uh, came to an end in, in, in that year or in that period. Uh, but take notice of the promise of victory uh, to this church of uh, Thyatira. Uh, it says, and he who overcomes, because there will always be those that will overcome. There will always be those that in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of darkness, will still keep their eyes on the light, that will still follow the Bible no matter what. So those that overcome, what will they do? They will keep my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. Now, this is kind of a fascinating phrase, power over the nations. What was the problem during the time of Thyatira, this church period that is being described? The problem was that the nations had power over the Christians. But what Jesus says is, I'm going to turn the tables. And if you are faithful, and if you remain faithful, then, then, then that power... And the power here is talking about the, the, the true inner power that comes from a connection with Jesus Christ will be given to those that overcome. And then it says, and I will give him the morning star. The morning star is really a reference, again, to the word of God. And so we are moving rapidly through the corridors of time. We are going from the apostolic church to the persecuted church, to the compromising church, to the persecuting church. And I believe that um, this, these seven letters, isn't it fascinating to just think about that Jesus get inspired seven letters that were written 2,000 years ago that have prophetic elements in them that describe the course of the Christian church over the last 2,000 years. I mean, what an amazing revelation that is to you and to me so that when we meet people that say, hey, uh, I'm finished with Christianity. I don't like Christianity because of this and this and this. Then you can say, well, you know, just, just, just give me five minutes. Just give me 10 minutes. Just let me open the Bible for a moment and show that what you're saying was actually prophesied. It was actually revealed to John that this was going to happen. And again, we have the privilege of hindsight. We have the privilege of looking back and seeing how this has developed throughout the 
uh, history of the last 2,000 years. Now let's move on to the next epoch in church history, and that is the city of Sardis, the letter that was written to Sardis. And again, we have the introduction of Jesus. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I'm not going to use too much time on that, but seven is a very significant number in the Bible. It means completion. Uh, there's, you know, we have the seven days of the week. Uh, in the book of Revelation, you find many sevens. The seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven plagues. There's lots of sevens. Uh, the seven spirits of God, the fullness of the presence of God. Um, what is Jesus saying here? Take notice of the message itself. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Now, that's an interesting phase because during the Dark Ages, a lot of truth was getting lost. A lot of truth was being covered up by the traditions of man. And so in the course of, of, of this period of the Dark Ages, people are losing sight of what the Bible actually teaches and what Jesus actually taught. And so they are losing sight of this. And, and the message here to Sardis is, you know what? Strengthen that which, is, which remains. Get back into what I have revealed. And then it says um, that are ready to die. So this is about to, to be gone. But, but, but hold on to what you have. For I have not found your works perfect before God. It's a call to a higher standard. And when you look at the Christian uh, development, we come to a period after or in the latter part of these dark ages that we can refer to as we all uh, know this period that is referred to as the Reformation. Now, what was the Reformation all about? Actually, the name itself tells us what it's about. It's to reform. It's to get back to something that has been lost. As a matter of fact, I like to think of church history. This is kind of like a crash course in church history without crashing, hopefully. But in church history, you can kind of think of three phases of development. We have the formation of the church. So Jesus calls his 12 disciples. He teaches them. He sends them out under the uh, injunction of the Holy Spirit to teach and to preach and to raise up believers. And so that's the formation of the church. Then you have what we can call the deformation of the church, where everything went south. During the Dark Ages, truth is being lost. The church has linked itself with political powers. Things are going very bad. But then out of this deformation period, we have what we can call the Reformation. And the Reformation is actually a call back to the scriptures. And you might remember that during the Reformation, there was a slogan. And the slogan of the Reformation was, maybe someone can finish it if I say the first word, sola scriptura. And what does it mean? It's Latin for the word of God alone. Now, why the word of God alone? Well, because there was a need to get back to the word of God alone because there were so many man-made traditions that had been heaped on the word of God. There were so many traditions of man that had now piled upon the word of God that it was hardly it was hardly recognizable again the church of Christ you could hardly recognize it as a body of believers centered on the person Jesus it had become everything but that it had become political it had become a power struggle it had become a very atrocious picture of God was being presented through horrific doctrines that you don't find in this book. And we're going to get a little bit more into that uh, in the course of our third night, but uh, our third evening together. But what, this, what the Reformation was about is like an, it, it, it calling people to get back to the word of God, sola scriptura, to get back to the scriptures. And of course, there were different uh, uh, people that were used, uh, I believe, by God to, to bring this call to come back to Scripture. We have people like uh, John Swingley, and we have uh, Wycliffe, uh, John Wycliffe. We have uh, Martin Luther, later John Wesley, and many others that were used uh, during this period. Uh, but take notice of the promise that is given to the church of Sardis, this Reformation period. It says, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his 
angels. Again, comes back this word again and again in these letters. He who overcomes, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. And those that are overcoming, those are basically those that are able to recognize the teachings and call of Jesus on their life despite all the misrepresentation through organized religion throughout the centuries. And this is something that, that I believe is so important for us today as well. All right, well, we're moving on here, and um, I find it particularly interesting as we're now getting closer and closer to, to our time, <laughs> to our period. Uh, we go from the apostolic church to the persecuting church, the compromising church, and then the persecuting church itself, and then the corrupt church, but also during this fifth period, the reformation, holding on to that which remains, a call to come back, and then we have just two periods left, and we come to the letter, the sixth letter to the city of Philadelphia. Now, basically every name has also a meaning. And I haven't used the time tonight to go into that. But I will mention that Philadelphia, maybe some of you know, Philadelphia means brotherly love. And it's kind of interesting because the, 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 the letter that is written to Philadelphia is also about this brotherly love that existed between uh, the believers. There was this unity. And because they had unity, they were able to accomplish a lot. Take notice of the description here that Jesus gives us to the church of Philadelphia. These things says, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. So the letter here is about some door that is being opened, some opportunity that is being opened. Now, if you, if you do a little word study on open doors in the Bible, you will find out that this expression is often used with the proclamation of the gospel. In the book of Acts, you will find it several times. Paul will say, a door has been opened. And then he says how he preached the message in a town, in a city, and many people responded to it, and a church was started. Uh, and so here it talks about Jesus is going to open a door. Now, it's very interesting. As we come out of the Dark Ages and we move through the period of the Reformation, we come to a period in history which is now more recent to us than all other periods that we've been discussing tonight. During the 1800s, there was a massive movement of getting the Bible into the hands of millions of people around the world. Uh, prior to that, well, of course, you know, you go back to before the 1400s, well, you didn't have the printing press. Uh, then you get the printing press, which of course gave a big uh, strength to the Reformation movement. But also after that, what was the first book, by the way, that was printed on the printing press? The Bible. The Bible was the first book printed ever. And so, and so this is now being spread into so many different languages, into so many different places. A door is being opened for the spread of the gospel. It's also a period where many missionaries went to various places far and wide to proclaim the message of Jesus. Now take notice of uh, the counsel that is given to Philadelphia. Jesus says, I know your work. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength and you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. A message of unity, a united body of believers that are preaching the word of God in many different places. Doors are being opened and the gospel is, is going into all the world. Now, at this point, you would say, ah, this is a nice place to kind of close. <laughs> and let's hope that we are just kind of part of this today, and the gospel is going into all the world, and soon Jesus will come back, and that would be great. But there's one more letter. It's the seventh letter. It's the last letter. It's a letter that describes, I believe, Christianity in the 21st century. Now take a, look, take a look at this. We're now, and oh, here's the, we'll read first the victory given to Philadelphia before we get into this final letter. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of God, and I will write on him my new name. Beautiful promise. But take notice of the seventh letter here to Laodicea. Laodicea means, actually the meaning of the word is lukewarm. Now, archaeology, in, in the archaeological perspective of history, this name was already quite specific, uh, quite interesting because 
Laodicea was a city where they had hot springs that led water through an aqueduct into the city. So it was very like modern for that time, 2000 years ago, when, when, when John was writing this to the city of, of Laodicea. But what happened was when the hot water through the aqueduct came to the city, by the time it got to the city, it was lukewarm. And so the name implies this kind of lukewarm water. Now, what does that have to do with this being the seventh letter and thinking about a historicism approach, what does this mean about a description of the church today? Well, let's take a look at what the council to Laodicea actually says. Jesus says the following. This is his introduction. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, we're in the seventh letter. We're getting very close. There's no eighth letter. There's no ninth letter. We're getting closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and, he say, and he's referring back to the creation of God. The last church that is described here in Revelation needs to understand something about how things began. And how did things bega begin? Well, the, what, is the, what is the first thing you read about when you open your Bible in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 1? In the beginning, God created the world. How did he create it? By the word of his mouth. So there's a creative power by the word of God. Probably something that the last church needs to know, needs to realize that there's power in the word. Take notice of the description. It's by far not flattering. But remember, before I read this, let me say this. <laughs> when you go to the doctor and um, you want the doctor to give you a diagnosis of your health, you actually want that diagnosis to be truthful, even though it might affect you, even though it's not good news, you would still want the doctor to say what is the case with you because that's the beginning of the road to healing, right? If you know what actually is going on. So, so take these words as the words of the great physician Jesus as he diagnoses the church today. Listen to what he says. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, and cold means indifferent to the gospel, hot on fire. The church is not cold, but it's not hot either. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. And of course, this is spiritual language here saying that, you believe you are okay, but you lack something essential and pivotal. And what the church is lacking is the very presence of the person Jesus. It's his teaching and his spirit that is lacking. They say, oh, but we're fine, we're doing fine. It's an indifferent church, and it is being diagnosed here by the great physician Jesus himself. Now, do we, do we kind of see this in the Christianity today? I mean, and I'm just thinking like Christianity large, like doesn't matter, I'm not talking about a specific denomination, I'm talking about Christianity throughout the world. I believe that this description is a very accurate description of Christianity in our world today. It has become lukewarm, it has become indifferent, it is more occupied with the things of this world than it is occupied with the actual person and teachings of Jesus. In some places it's become political, in some places it's become a tradition, in some places it's become a philosophy, but it has lost its, 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 its fervor and its centrality in the person Jesus himself. But what I find so beautiful is that Jesus doesn't just give a diagnosis and just says, okay, figure it out, <laughs> try to fix yourself. No, Jesus comes with the solution. He tells us what we need. And, you know, it's very easy for us to point fingers and say, okay, Laodicea is over there or over there. But I think we just need to be honest with ourselves. Like, okay, there's some Laodicea in all of us, and we all need this counsel that Jesus gives us. And listen to what he says. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now, this is all symbolic language that we will unpack in just a moment. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye self that you may see. Now, what was the problem with the church? 
Well, they were poor. Well, Jesus says, you'll get some gold from me. Uh, they were naked. Well, he says, you'll be clothed. They were blind. And Jesus says, you're going to, I'm going to anoint your eyes. Now, it's not that the church is literally poor, blind, and naked. This is symbolic language. Now, as we unpack this and compare scripture with scripture, take notice what these three things actually mean. What is the gold refined in the fire? Well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 tells us, Peter, which was one of the apostles of Jesus, says the following, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So our faith is compared with gold. And so what is Jesus saying? I'm going to give you a beautiful, powerful faith. And this is a gift that he places in our hearts. This is what he wants to give us, a faith that is tested. How about the white garment? Interesting, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And this is also a symbolic language that, that, that we can find throughout Scripture, from Genesis, the first book in the Bible, to Revelation, the last book in the Bible. There's this language that comes back again and again and again, and it says that God wants to clothe his people, and it means he wants to fill them with his character, his righteousness. You know, when the first human beings sinned, when they, when they took up that tree that they were not supposed to eat from, they hid themselves, but then... God comes into the Garden of Eden and he clothes them. And this is a theme throughout scripture. And he wants to clothe us with the garments of salvation. What about the I self? Well, take a look at this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you, may be, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, a living sacrifice, what it means is just dedicate your life to God. And when you dedicate your life to God, God is going to fill your mind with the Holy Spirit and he's going to give you the gift of discernment. You're going to be able to discern between what comes from God and what doesn't come from him. And this is exactly what the lukewarm church needs. The lukewarm church is not able to discern, but this is the gift of Christ. You're going to be able to see, ah, this is what the scriptures teach. This is what I need to follow. This is how I can experience true Christianity and a unity with the person Jesus. And then I love how this letter, uh, when it comes to the end of this letter to Laodicea, I just love what Jesus says here in verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, in the first century language, this idea of sharing a meal together uh, was something very personal, very close. It was the way that you would build relationships. And so Jesus says to the church, both back then and today, I want to have this personal connection with you. I want to dine with you. I want, to, I want you to experience who I really am. This is what Jesus is communicating through this message. And then the promise of victory to the Laodicean church, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, this has been quite a journey tonight, but what we have done is we've gone back 2,000 years and we have kind of allowed these seven letters to inform us about the development of the Christian church. And we have found that it has lots of ups and downs. And at times, it has really lost its plot. But by God's grace, in the end, there will be those that will overcome also in the final church. And that will be part of giving a message to the world that will restore the teachings of Jesus and put them in their right place. 
And that is a powerful thing to be part of. To be able to take the word of God and to be able to go back to the roots of Christianity and say, what did Jesus actually teach? And yes, there's a lot of things that have happened over the last 2,000 years in the name of Jesus that Jesus actually had nothing to do with. But we can peel back these layers of man-made religion and we can back, get back to this authentic movement. And I believe that God wants to raise up again an authentic movement of followers of the true Christ. Again, we are looking here at religion versus Jesus. Many things have been done in the name of religion that have nothing to do with the person of Jesus. And it's very important for us to, able, to be able to distinguish these things. What I find very compelling and powerful is that the Bible itself is not obnoxious to these things. The Bible itself, God knew what was going to happen and he prepared us for it. He gave us prophecy and very clear prophecies in various portions of the Bible that describe what was going to happen from the first century until today. And tonight, I just presented one of them. This is just Revelation chapters 2 and 3, but we're going to go into several. Tonight, tomorrow night, we're going to go into total different prophecy. And if you didn't find tonight to be so compelling, maybe tomorrow will be even more compelling. And you'll see how prophecy predicted what we see has taken place. And of course, the very encouraging message in these seven churches is that we're getting closer and closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus. He said, I will come again. And his second coming is going to be very different than his first coming. In his first coming, he was born in a manger. In his second coming, he returns as king of kings and lord of lords to restore this earth back to its beauty, its Edenic beauty that it had in the beginning. Now, I want to close with um, a couple of thoughts and then, and then we'll, um, we'll wrap up uh, this first presentation tonight. There was a study done some years back, actually uh, about 10 years ago in 2013, very interesting study by uh, Cambridge University or published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, and uh, it was a book that was written by the computer scientist Stephen uh, Skiana and Google engineer Charles Ward. And uh, the book was titled, Who's Bigger? And the subtitle is, Where Historic Figures Really Rank. And what the, basically the study did is it ranks historical figures in order of significance. Now, of course, if I would ask you today to write down, you know, 10 people that you believe have influenced history, then you, 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 you would be able to write that and someone else would write that and maybe the list would be slightly different, but there would be also some overlap of, 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 of agreement, I believe, in, in which figures throughout history have really made an impact. But this study was a little bit interesting because it was a little bit of a different kind of approach. Actually, they described how they went about figuring out the impact of historic figures because it says the following in the book. It says, um, these are, this is written by the writers, um, the computer uh, engineer and uh, the Google engineer and the computer scientist. They say, we do not answer these questions as historians might. So as a historian, you would approach this in a certain way. But these are not historians that wrote this book. Um, though a principled assessment of their individual, through a, a principled assessment of their individual achievements, instead we evaluate each person by aggregating the traces of millions of opinions in a rigorous and principled manner. So looking, okay, what are the traces of these historical individuals? We measure meme strength. How successfully is the idea of this person being propagated through time. Now, you might be interesting, it might be interesting to see then what 10 names they came up with. <laughs> well, uh, here they are. And take notice of the one that got position number one. Position, and these are not religious people that are writing this book. Uh, but position number one, Jesus. Now, of course, you can argue maybe the order of this, or you might say, yeah, but I'm missing a very significant name. But the point is this, the point is this. There is no doubt that the person Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago in a little location, basically unsignificant location in the Roman Empire, has left a trace in the world that is not even comparable with any other figure in history. I mean, we even date our whole system of reckoning of time on the birth of Jesus. 
I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, there is so much influence that has come through the person Jesus that just can't be denied. Now, the most influential figure in history is by far the person Jesus Christ. Now, I, I put here for good reasons because I believe that he is the most fascinating figure in history. Uh, sadly, there's a lot of baggage that is connected to his name, <laughs> and that's unfortunate. But if you kind of take away this baggage and you just look at the person Jesus, yeah, for good reasons, he has left his footprints and there are traces of his fingerprints all over history. You know, Alvin Plantinga, which is an analytic philosopher and Christian, I just, loved, I just loved the way he put it. Talking about the gospel story, he wrote the following. Listen to this. The overwhelming display of love and mercy is not merely the greatest story ever told. It is the greatest story that could be told. Yeah, it's, not, it's not just that the gospel is a great story. It's actually that you can't think of a better story. That's what he's saying. And I totally agree. There is no greater or more beautiful story that exists, as far as what I've come about, than the gospel story. The love of a supreme God that sent his son into this world to give his life for you and for me. And when we, when we look at the depth of that gospel story, it is truly the greatest story that could be told. We have a Bible that is made up of 66 books, yet, yet it is a unified story. And here we end our presentation for tonight. This is our last slide, but I thought I wanted to share this with you. Maybe some of you have seen this before. This graph is made by a man by the name of Chris Harrison, and uh, he is a visual artist. And what he did in this graph is he took all the Bible books in the Bible. So this is the book of Genesis. This is Exodus. This is Leviticus. This is Numbers. This is Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Revelation. So these are all the books of the Bible. And the lines are the chapters in the Bible. So this is just Genesis chapter 1. Uh, this is actually the book of Psalms. And maybe you know what is the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119. So that's the longest chapter in the Bible. This is Revelation chapter 22. Now, what he did is he took all the chapters in the Bible, all the books in the Bible, and then he looked at how words connect. And this is fascinating because this is not one author that wrote the Bible. Like, if you take the book of the Koran, it's written by one person. Um, and, and there are many religions out in the world where you have holy books that are written by specific people. The Bible was written by 40 different people. And yet there is this incredible harmony between all of these passages and concepts and words and, and themes that connect the whole story as one story. I mean, 1,500 years. 40 different authors, different cultures, different backgrounds. There are shepherds that wrote this story. There are kings that wrote this story. There are prophets that wrote this story. There are songwriters that wrote this story. There are all these different individuals, and yet a unified theme. And guess what? This rainbow of Bible connections, in the end, is about one person, and it's the person Jesus Christ. The whole story unites in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus himself very famously said, you read the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life. These are they that testify of me. He referred to this whole story as centered in him. The Old Testament prophesied the coming of Jesus. The New Testament described Jesus and what he had done. And so we have a story that is leading up through the centuries to this individual. And he comes and he fulfills all of these prophecies. And then there are more prophecies about how he's one day going to come back. And the beautiful thing for you and for me is though Christianity has lost the plot, Christ has not lost the plot. Amen? I mean, his plot, his story is going to come to a culmination as this rainbow will come to a final end when Jesus returns and restores all things. And though Christianity has lost its plot, the grand story of Scripture has not 
lost its plot. And so I invite you to come back tomorrow night as we, com as we continue our journey together in Bible prophecy, seeing how the, the, the difference and the comparisons and the contrast between religion and Jesus. And I think you're going to find something very compelling and beautiful. And that is that, yes, we're going we're gonna to discover a lot more about how Christianity has lost its plot, also in our day today. But beyond that, I hope that we can light a kindle, that we can kindle a flame, that we can bring our attention to the grand narrative of Scripture and that we can actually find our identity in this marvelous story. So with that, let's have a closing word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, it's been a wonderful time as we have journeyed through Revelations chapters 2 and 3. Lord, I just want to thank you for the beautiful narrative of Scripture. I want to thank you for the person Jesus and that we can find our place, that we can find meaning and purpose in this great grand story. And so I pray that you will be with us the rest of this evening. Bring us back tomorrow night as we continue our journey together is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for coming. I hope to see you tomorrow night as we continue our journey. Thank you very much.